Well, thank you for listening to the Forefront Church podcast. We have a very special guest with us today, but I just want to give you the heads up as you start listening to this podcast, we are going to cover adult topics and issues. So if you are in the car listening with little ones around, you may want to listen to this first till you listen to it with them. So just giving you the heads up, we'll give you a moment here to make the transition as I introduce, introduce Pastor Drew, Drew Tarwater. How are you doing today, sir? I'm good, Rob. Always good to be with you. Absolutely. And we have a very special guest, guest with us. Stephen Andre, he is a he is a relationship counselor specializing in sexual compulsive behavior, trauma, and their effects on the individual, the relationship, and the family system. That's a mouthful, there, Stephen. How you doing, sir? I am well. Did I get I'm that all? Be in uh, Denver or Colorado with you guys virtually. It's kind of fun. No, absolutely. I hope, you know, it's a, we'll share some snow with you guys out there in Ohio. No, you yeah, should that. Just the mountains. <laughs> Send me some mountains. Yeah, Rob, we should have recorded this from, um, you know, the top of Pike's Peak or somewhere. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Rub it in is what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, no. Well, we le I left Ohio for reasons. Stephen, you're welcome to come out and visit anytime. So. Oh, I'm there. All right. Yeah, we'll have to... We'll Absolutely. see if we'll see if the invite stays after this conversation. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, Stephen, it's so good to have you on the podcast with Rob and I, and you know I'm really excited about this conversation. Um, you know, I think one of the things we've seen coming out of the pandemic is that um, more than than ever, people I think are are more realistic with themselves. That relationships are hard, and people need to seek help and advice. And I know just personally, just talking with families. Um, it, it has exposed so many things kind of under the surface. And so as we navigate really this new world we're in, I think it's really important topic for us to talk about. What is the, you know, what, what are really those kind of undergirding elements to healthy relationships? Let's talk about the importance of healthy relationships. And coming from my perspective as a, as a local church pastor, you know, I, we believe that God created us for healthy relationships. And, and so, um, recognizing the difficulty in that how do we help people take that step forward towards health and when there are difficulties in relationship not brush them under the rug or maybe feel that we're trapped in a, in a world of guilt and shame but be honest and open that we need to seek uh, restoration and help together so really excited to have this conversation with you today oh, i'm so excited to be a part of this and offer some insight that supports your guys church and your community so Really value you both. So thanks for having me. Well, thank you. So, so Stephen, what's the, what are the, like, what are the benefits of a healthy relationship? Have you seen it in your practice? Like once you get people through the issues, like, or even before the issues, like what's the, the benefit versus like when they're in their traumatic experience? Probably want to ask a question before that. And it's really coming into this discussion with a couple of really profound, rooted understandings. First of all, to kind of piggyback off what Drew shared is the way we are designed is very intentional, right? And so the way God created us is actually for relationship, right? In our field, there's actually something called interpersonal neurobiology. And what it's really studying with accurate and really powerful data that the brain and nervous system really respond well to healthy relationship. The inverse is true, that there is a profound effect on the nervous system and the brain when you're in unhealthy relationship. That's not a good or bad place. It's a healthy versus unhealthy. So the way we're designed intentionally and creatively, relationship thrives our nervous system. Our brain literally gets bigger, our nervous system fires at higher levels. The second piece we want to understand coming into this is more a humbling place that we have been taught poorly what relationship is and how to do relationship. We've got to dig a little deeper. We've got to kind of start with some of the basics that we were never taught. There's a thing we talk about in our groups in an individual session, and that's we're never going to hold you accountable for what you've never been taught or given. And most of that comes out of our family system and other communities. If we're not taught and then we're held responsible, we ramp up guilt and shame. 
Why? Because we're expecting people to learn how to do something they've never been taught to do. So they figure they should know how to do it. And hence the problem becomes them. We got to get that off the table. That's powerful, Stephen, you know, to think about the, the beauty of God's creation and how he created us with everything that interworks and has, has been interwoven together to think that when you look at our life and we say, I, you know, I'm walking through a season of depression or I'm walking through a season of anxiety, um, you know, there is this common uh, root design that God has given us for relationships. And so, right. you know, one of the important things is looking under the hood and saying, well, how are my relationships right now? And that can be such a driver towards physical health, mental health, spiritual health. Um, right. And and it's, I think it's beautiful to, to realize and for you to, to be able to explain this to uh, the church and, and our listeners that life isn't compartmentalized, right? It's not, there's one little box on the shelf and I'm going to pull it out and then I'll, right. I'll deal with that. But in it, fact, that's actually a together. lie we've bought into. Right, right. We are actually, compartmentalization is actually at times traumatic. Hmm. So the reality is I'm the same person here in this podcast that I am with my wife, that I am with my colleagues, that I am in my communities and church. I have different boundaries in each setting. Like you guys don't get to know about my sex life or you don't get to know about some of the other things that may be really deeply personal. Sure. The other thing that's really powerful about something you said there, Drew, is this idea of depression and anxiety. In the culture, we have shamed that. Mm. So we create trauma around feeling. What we don't do well is suffer well. We don't value emotional presence. We've often shamed it. Don't wow. worry. Don't fear. The two number one traumas I see in my uh, counseling office, emotional neglect. So a system that has denied our ability to feel or a lack of teaching around my emotions, spiritual abuse inaccurate teaching scripturally. The idea, don't fear, don't worry. No, I would offer my perspective. You guys get to be the scholars, but I think God's really telling us to just settle into the now. He's reminding us that he's God. He's got tomorrow. We have enough to yeah. what? worry about today. Right. The catch of that is, when we don't let ourselves feel, we chop off half of who we are. That's the body information. If we're designed for community, we attach through the body and through feelings and emotions. We don't ta attach through facts. Right. So yeah. when we connect to, and we are all afraid of suffering. Now, there's a suffering because of. I don't want to do that. Like, I don't want to shame either of you guys. But when we learn to suffer together, we create a higher level of attachment. My wife and I have four adoptive children and they each have their own trauma story. My wife and I have suffered with our children and it's created a, deep, created a deeper marriage because together we've prayed, together we've hurt, together we've cried. And then some of the community that we've trusted has been part of that. Rich community right there. You know, that's so beautiful, Stephen, to think about, you know, the reality of life is that everybody is going to walk through seasons of suffering and affliction. That is just the human experience. But you think about the concept that God calls us, like in Galatians, when Paul talks about God calls us to bear each other's burdens and we're called to be in this community together. And so how do we pick each other up and carry each other and help each other to know that here we're not here to cast guilt or shame but we're here to be freed and released from that and so i think there's so much power in god's people recognizing that the church is more than just a place you go but it's right. a place to be real and to be honest and belong because god wants to use that to build something greater through us right and then you have the scripture that says suffering produces what perseverance and character perseverance. and eventually hope in christ and right. that hope doesn't disappoint. Right. And there's also that place that we see walk out profoundly when we see the scriptures around the body. 
right? And the toe can't criticize the finger or can't do without it, right? But there's a deeper place there. Like, for example, Rob or Drew, if you guys are hurting and I suffer with you, if you are healthier, I become healthier. If I am less healthy, you're a little less healthy because we are brothers in Christ. We are the same body. The healthier we become, the more we're connected we become relationally, the more that allows stuff to heal. And the reality is we are feeling a plethora of emotions at any given moment. I'm a little anxious to make sure I give you guys my best here now. And I know that there's some tension over here and there's a little bit of joy I'm experiencing here and I sure can't wait to get to my family because I love them, right? There's this all this rich stuff going on within me and that informs how I do life in the moment. No, that's that's great to think about. When you, I like what you said. There were like the different spheres that you have in your life where you're like, you're excited for the joy to see your family, but you have the tension, maybe something at work and you have all these things. And like, how does that relate to that compartmentalization that you were talking about earlier where it's like, we, we, like I'm a good compartmentalizer. So no, what I would offer if you're a good compartmentalizer, you have poor boundaries. Okay. And the reason is you're trying to separate and isolate your life. Let's get real here, Rob. Come on. Yeah, let's get down. Okay. Into the- <laughs> I'm going to sit on the couch here. He's, going- so, he's really got a wonderful situation, but I'm just saying language. And I will be honest, guys, I'm very anal around language because we think way too black or white. It's right or it's wrong. It's good or it's bad. It's positive or negative. Most of the time, those can be filtered through. Is it healthy or not healthy? And what happens is when we help the guys I work with understand it's about boundaries, no one has a right to your story except for your partner, right? There's a covenant there that we committed to. My wife has a right to my story because my story affects her. But the guy in the pew next to me, if I don't have much of a relationship, does not have a right to know the depth of my story, right? So what we want to understand is I have a different boundary with him than I do with my wife. So, and what we're really learning to do is redefine intimacy. Mm, that's because so intimacy is really a depth of the heart and it starts vertically before it ever gets horizontal. If I don't have a depth of intimacy and in knowing me through Christ, I can never offer that to another person. So what happens is we've got a culture that redefines its intimacy intimacy through its genitals. Wow. We've got a huge tsunami of pornography and all. This isn't just about porn. The uh, sex trade, sex trafficking, the amount of affairs, the amount of prostitution is just staggering what I see in my office. The LBGTQ community. This, the amount of pain in that culture and the amount of confusion, not judging it, we work with anybody, but the church demonizes people who are hurting. And that community is really looking for deeper connection, often filtered through the genitals. Am I allowed to do what I want to do? Right? So this whole idea that we have lost real intimacy, probably never been accurately clearly defined. So we go with what feels. So what we're really doing is numbing, not really embracing the depth and breadth of what God gave us. You know, Stephen, that is so powerful, uh, what you just shared, because I think as people, we, we define ourselves by what we do and by how we feel, by what we think, and instead of, yeah, right, instead of who what, we are. Right. To be seen and loved. Yeah. Exactly. Will you love me, Drew? Drew, will you love me? Mm-hmm. Will you walk with me? Right. Will you hold me and just let me know I'm okay when I'm hurting? And that there's so much power in knowing that your Heavenly Father has created you for relationship and for community and for something deeper. And that defines your identity. And then you can live out who you are in, 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 in light of what Christ has done for you and find freedom in your relationships. You know, and I think that, man, I love what you just said there, because this is something that, 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 you know, we think about the church for too many people think about the church as this place where, Oh, if, if, as long as I say yes to Jesus, I get to go to heaven someday when I die, but then I'm just going to live in this mess. 
And, you know, Jesus continues to come and say, I come to bring what is best for you. And Mm -hmm. when we say that Jesus is the hope of the world, we don't just mean that one day when you die, you get to go to heaven. We mean that Jesus can come in and re and and help you reimagine and see who God created you to be. And then that will play out in your relationships and the way you live your life to a point where you can flourish living in, in in this world. You're saying, see, this is the beauty of your church. Right. If we go back to the body analogy, Jesus comes in as the head. Mm, right. But he needs us as the body. It's a both and. It's not an either or. We have to reach out to the other person in the pew to get to know them, to build some level of connection. That's the beauty of your leading your church. It's about that body that has Christ as the head, but we have to be the practical. Right. And we tend to just. The other flip side that I see, and this is a challenge when I talk to churches, is there's this mantra or, no, I hate mantra because that's not what we believe in, right? But there's this kind of message that many people come into church with that you need to feed me, Drew, because you're the pastor. And I think that's true for newer believers. But there's a level of discipleship. When we get to it, it shifts. So... I have studied a lot. There's a lot of books behind me. There's a lot of books here. I've got a lot of information, but that's not an arrogant place. It's a humble place for me, the way I view it, to bring that into the church. In other words, I don't need the church to feed me. I would want to walk alongside you and feed those that need me to help feed, to be fed. In other words, it's the 80-20 rule. There are those people that need that. But when I get to a point, I need to be part of the church, being that church in every Sunday, not just keeping you feed. Drew, feed me. Drew, feed me. No. Drew, I'm with you. I'm going to help feed those that are hurting. Is that part of the like the thought process where it's like in the Bible? It's a biblical principle, I guess, like where we should be giving more than we take. Well, I wouldn't use the word should. And I'm not I'm not picking, but here's why I get anal, because should in my world triggers shame. Oh, we tell people you should. Oh, wow. Okay. When they never have been trained how. We've got to walk them from A to B. Okay. Hmm. In other words, there's a, a thing I use with uh, almost every client, and it's this idea of who do you control? Well, the answer is us. We control ourselves. What do we control? Our choices based on what we're thinking and feeling and believing. And then the question becomes when, and it's only in the moment. The profound truth is I will only have a choice in the moment, but I always have a choice. So my choice is based on what you've guided me into in a belief system, what I'm feeling in the moment and what I'm processing in the moment cognitively. If I can get those three interacting at higher levels, you have biblical wisdom. You have this kind of thing. Stephen, what I love about this conversation is you giving handles to language. You know, I think of, you know, one, one of the, the things that I, you know, came to terms with a long time ago is instead of saying, I don't have time to say, I, I don't, I haven't made time because right. it helps you to see you have control over your time. And I think what you're talking about with this concept of should and, and what I must do. And when I start to put handles to language, it allows me to navigate better to see that I do have control. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. if somebody says, well, I can't stop looking at pornography or I, I can't stop sleeping around, it, there, there becomes this false lie and this false narrative they buy into. And they right. begin to think they don't have control, but changing of language can regain the ability to see that I do have through the power of Christ to navigate these challenges. Right. And There's simple exercises. If you just sit there and talk to yourself, I should do this. I should do that. Just say it a few times and then say, no, I'm choosing to do this. You can literally feel a difference in the body. Hmm. The one thing we also want to understand is when there are these places like guys who act out sexually or guys who are looking pornography, we have to hear that there's a cry for help. And we tend to look at the symptom and not what's really being said. Mm, Right. Pornography is a depth. It's a heart cry for intimacy. And the addictive behavior, and I would also offer alcoholism, workaholism, drug use, are all cries to numb the pain. 
So if we reloop, what they're saying is, I don't want to feel this drug. This drug is my best friend because it promised me I don't have to feel, which is contrary to how we're designed. It conflicts with the God intentional design. It's actually helping people understand we're allowed to feel, we want to feel, we want to interact with the feelings to get the information they offer. First thing that happens when you touch something hot is what? Reaction. No. Pulling away. No. You feel the heat? You feel the heat. Uh, Through what? Very intentionally designed fingers. Mm. God is saying, protect my precious creation. Right. Same nervous system here is here. But we demonize this. We don't get, dang, fingers, why did you feel? No, that's stupid. But we do that here. Why, fingers, why are you feeling? So I reach for the bottle. I reach for the porn. I reach for an affair. Because I'm chasing this idea that you can make me feel valuable. But Christ suffered with us to communicate value. And I think we have to communicate that to those that are hurting. And that's a that's a powerful statement, Stephen. Um, that that concept that Christ suffered to communicate value to us. You know, so often we treat the symptoms and not the deeper the yeah. deeper issue. And the deeper issue, as you mentioned, is the feeling of uh, that the, the needing to feel loved or or the lack of intimacy or, or or whatever it is, right? Identity. And so we try to numb the pain, but realizing that Jesus experienced the pain of the cross and rose from the grave to defeat death and have victory. And right. he did that to communicate value that we are so valuable to him that he um, is, is all we need to learn and to have the power to overcome the grasps of sin so that we can step into that, that new life that he created us to live of abundance and, you know, freedom of, of deepness in relationships and, and richness in community. And it really starts with seeing, it, as I hear you speak, you, you see the symptoms as the cry for help, but let's dig into the deeper issue. And that is that identity and need for love and intimacy. Right. And what does that look like? Remember, all of us come from families. And our families taught us what intimacy and love look like. And more often than not, and I would say all of us, and I know that's a global statement, have levels of wounds from that family system, miscommunicated intimacy. And the reality is there's only one authentic, right? And so when we learn the author of love, when we walk with him, very profound story. I worked with a client a few years ago who had suffered horrible abuse in his family system, horrible neglect and physical and, and, the, and just profound abuse. He told me about one time in his prayer, he's a strong believer. And I really valued how he shared that he was in his prayer closet, praying and lamenting. And just for the record, I don't think we lament well before the Lord. I don't think we cry out to him well. Yeah, you're I right. I think we suffer well. Yeah. So he was doing that. And he's like, God, where were you? And pastor, you're allowed to push against any of my theology, just for the record. <laughs> Correct. But no, I think, you know, look at how many Psalms where David cries out, right. you know, Lord, where, Lord, where are you? I don't feel like you're here with me. So I exactly. think that's, yeah. It's a beautiful, those are beautiful prayers. Well, he was doing something like that. And he's like, where were you in this suffering? And then every time I think I can feel the tears coming, he heard God's still small voice say, I was there suffering. With you. Wow. Oh, wow. wow. Look, here's what I will offer. Most of us blame God for our suffering. And most of us say, God, why? But here's what I would offer. And please, this is where I really want you, Drew, to push against my theology. But I remember the garden and Adam and Eve. And I see in there the empowerment of free choice. God gave us a choice. And sin sometimes is that willful choice to choose other than God. The reality of that, though, is when I choose poorly, I have to live with the consequences. I can't Absolutely. change these guys have had an affair. I can help heal it, 
but I can't eliminate what happened. There right. are consequences for their lives. Sometimes it's very profound. Hmm. The second level of that, though, is if I choose poorly, my wife is affected. And she has to live with my consequences. Right. Well, that's even bigger. You just play that out. So most of the time we're lamenting before God, saying, God, why did this happen? What we're really saying is, God, why didn't you make me a robot and not give me free choice? Because we have to live with the reality. All of us have free choice. And your guy's choice affects me. It's so true. You know, Stephen, you think about the the garden and just that act of rebellion, right? God, he, 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 he says to them, you know, look, I have the best plan for you. Um, but they fell for the lie, which was if I, if I go my own way, I can decide what's right and wrong for myself because I want to be like God. Yes. And, and that's what we do every day without realizing it. We say, Hey, I'm going to choose to, to pursue this relationship or what I know is not right for me, or I'm going to make this negative choice uh, because I'm going to decide what's right and wrong for me. And the consequences come from that. And they don't just affect me. You're right. They affect my family. They affect my church, my kids, my, you know, my career. Mm -hmm. And there is that reality that we tend to blame God. Well, God, why didn't you stop this from happening? Right. When God says, well, I, you know, I created you and gave you free choice. Now, one of the beautiful things is God doesn't ever waste anything. And right. so God will use that to help um, build us up, to help use that story, to help to somebody else down the road, but it's still, the reality is we still have consequences for and our And what action. you just said is so powerful because the reality is a lot of the guys who come in with addiction, they pray for deliverance or some kind of miracle to just take it away. And when God doesn't, they get angry, but they don't ask the question is why would God not take it away? Mm, because your journey right. of healing is the 80 20 rule again oh wow where i'm there to pay it forward to help another person heal oh man i have so wisdom good. through my suffering to help another through suffering the healthiest people that are the most profoundly impactful in our groups are those that have walked through it themselves it's the band of brothers i know where you've been i know how you hurt and i have hope because i am there where you want to be and as, what's beautiful about that, Stephen, is it gives you freedom to know that there there is going to be a day when you can you can experience what God has for you. As long as no, glory for sure, right? Right. You know, and you look back at Romans five, like you said earlier. You know, as you go through affliction, it does lead to you know perseverance and endurance, to proven character and hope, and that hope doesn't disappoint. And so, as I walk through a crazy season of difficulty, I can share with you and Rob about how God was faithful, and that gives you perseverance and builds character that leads to hope. And so, you're right. That band of brothers, we all walk this journey together. So there creates accountability, uh, but there's no guilt and shame in that. Because right. it's the true desire. We want to help each of us get to the best place. Right. And that hope is where? Right at the foot of the cross with Christ suffering with us. And leaning into his strength, not my own. I can't do it without him. My recovery was profoundly impacted by the depth of my faith. Mm. And that has become my healthy addiction. I study more scripture. I study more books than I around that. I do a lot for this, but man, that's my living water. That's my, I need more. And I think that's another place I would encourage the listeners is we have to own our own study. Isn't there a scripture about study to show yourself approved, to give a defense for the faith you have? I embrace that as it starts with me. Amen. Right. And yep. then you, right. But no. we don't study well either. So no, absolutely. Uh, Stephen, if you, and think of like a, a local church, what would you encourage a local church to like action steps to sort of like, as you're talking about like healthy relationships, what can the local church do to strengthen themselves and their relationships? Uh, there is a, a really powerful statement Brene Brown made in her uh, Daring Greatly book. And it's about this concept that shame cannot exist in the same place where there's vulnerability. 
We want to start wow. gently and small and be vulnerable and open with ourselves. So my gift to you in relationship is a healthier me. I can't give you what I do not have. I need to own my own choices. I need to own my own healing through Christ because he's perfect, but I have to do my work and then I can pay it forward. But I also would recalibrate success. This isn't about changing a hundred people. It's about changing the life God has in front of me. We try to embrace the future. Hence, we have so many levels of anxiety. Anxiety is what? A fear of what's coming. But if we learn to live in the now, and wow, pastor just asked me to meet with this one young man, and you know what? I can buy him a cup of coffee. I can be vulnerable with my story. Yeah, okay, that's, that's good. I can do that. That's where it is. But all of a sudden, you've got a holy, thriving church. But it's one life at a time. We lose the one life. So many of these churches have as big an exit door as they do an entry door because the hurting just don't feel heard. They don't feel healthy. They have to conform to the church's mantras and the church's whatevers. And no, we're losing too many. I, to our listeners and those here at Forefront, I hope you guys are picking up on how just impactful and amazing what um, this conversation is. Stephen, thank you for, for what you said about vulnerability. You know, I think, and especially as guys, we are just so bad about being vulnerable. We want to keep it surface level. Let's talk sports and the weather. And we but, don't know how to, Pastor. And we don't. We don't. And yeah, we, have to. we were told, right. Shut up or I'll give you something to cry about. Yeah, you're exactly right. And what power exists as we learn to be vulnerable with yeah. each other, because then we are not walking this journey alone. We've got brothers and sisters um, and families walking with us through this. And I think if, if our listeners take anything away today, hold on to that as whatever your struggle is, whether it's relationships or it could be addiction, or it's just feeling unvalued or not knowing your identity, grasp onto that reality that be vulnerable so others can guide and walk with you to pursue what Jesus has for each of us. Uh, that, that's so powerful, Stephen. Thank you. Amen. You're welcome, guys. As we, for- as we wrap this up, Stephen, any uh, parting thoughts or words of encouragement you can give us? Yeah, I think I would I would start with the idea that each of us have value and worth as we are, not who we should be or could be, but who we literally are, including our scars. And I would embrace the people that God has brought around us and including our pastor. If I can speak to support Drew just a little bit, I'm pretty sure you're human. And I don't think it's your responsibility to heal us all. Mm. And I think there's a place we want to walk and link arms with you, not expect you to do it all. We have to take responsibility for ourselves in the communities we've been planted. So just take care of yourself first. There's this kind of place where we have to, you know, family, marriage first. No, if we're not sharp, we're not, if we don't know, we have, we're not prepared, we can't give anything away. An empty pot does not pour out very fresh water. So we have to be really aware that my gift to you is a sharp, healthy me, humbly confident, not arrogant. But I can have a role in this. No, that makes a wow. of sense. Like, so good. Like, like even like with like, it reminds me of the stories every time I go through the safety at the, on the airport where it's like, put your own mask on first. If you don't have yeah. your own mask on to help if something happens, you can't help other people out. Right. And don't expect my pastor to do it for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Stephen, we would love a, um, you know, maybe a couple recommended resources that we can put in the show notes or uh, recommend to the church for someone who listens to this and says, you know, I really want to take that next step. And, you know, we'll encourage them to connect with us and we'll connect them with local groups and counselors that we partner with. But is there a book or an online resource that you would recommend? We'd love to, to have some of that detail from you. Absolutely. Um, well, uh, first of all, I'll start with the Daring Greatly um, book. Brene Brown is pretty popular, um, but her book, Daring Greatly, is really about engaging in 
the battle. And it's a quote from, I think, Teddy Roosevelt. I may have that wrong. But it's at the beginning of the book. He gave a speech about the real courage is those who enter into the battle. The other thing I would, and this is a uh, general place, and I can't, I've been affectionately called a book bully, so I'm trying to whittle down who might be. So I really hold precious Kurt Thompson's work. Someday might get to buy him a cup of coffee and have dinner with him. Um, But he has a podcast called Being Known, as well as some phenomenal books. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. He is a Christian psychiatrist, psychologist, can't remember. Really powerful stuff. So that's a great place to start. So no, thanks, we, Steven. That's super yeah. helpful. No, we really appreciate it. If you're listening to this and you have questions or thoughts, you want to reach out to someone, reach out to us here at life at forefrontchurch.tv. We'll get you connected with any resources we can and get you connected with the right people. We thank you so much for listening. Any way we can help you out, connect with us, life at forefrontchurch.tv. Steven, once again, thank you so much for the time. I always, I always learn something every time I talk to you. Whether it's, so I, I <laughs> yeah, thank you, Stephen. Oh, you guys are awesome. Thanks. It's been great to have you on today. Yeah, great to get, to be here and meet you guys, especially you, Pastor. Yeah.